proceed to order, please. And if you could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Our flag is back against the, the wall on the second floor. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. I'd like to thank the uh, two members of our community for showing up this evening. Uh, it's a little, little underwhelming for a, uh, a fields discussion, but, but thank you all for being here and thank you all for, for watching on television. Um, the purpose of this meeting is to continue our discussion of our fields and facilities uh, proposals before the board. And at this point, I'd like to, oh, I'd also like to uh, apologize for uh, Mrs. Kerner's absence. She's uh, at another meeting dealing with a member of her family, um, and I'll, I'll make further comment on that later. Uh, when we uh, get to our proposed uh, um, adoption of, uh, 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 of our uh, uh, skill option. Um, but she apologizes for her absence. Um, I guess at this point I'd like to turn the... Uh, oh, uh, can I get a motion please from the board to accept the agenda? So uh, moved. Presented. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Phil first, uh, Maria second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. Uh, Dr. Harrison, your continued uh, discussion, please. So good evening. Um, obviously, we've gone through extensive process. There's been a much conversation. Um, we've had a presentation from the Fields Project Committee. We've had a presentation from the Buildings and Grounds Committee. Each recommended and discussed a series of projects uh, related to those specific areas that they were studying. Tonight, I just want to take a few moments, and within those moments, just giving an overview of what has been presented so far, far, talk about some cost implications for the district related to the scope of this work, and then realistically turn it to the board and community for any discussion on the matter. So I'd like to start with looking at the fields re uh, recap and the recommendations that grew out of the field project committee work. Um, first and foremost, uh, they had five areas of charge, which resulted in a couple major uh, decisions that the board has to contemplate um, tonight and in the next meeting, which is currently scheduled for April 1st. So with that said, the first was to look at East Field and consider how East Field could and would be remediated. And the committee unanimous, unanimously decided that the field should be improved with a new natural turf surface. Drainage should be installed, as should irrigation. Now, when we look at the actual field itself, we acknowledge that there were struggles with the field, that we found construction and demolition debris beneath the field, and we're working closely with DEC, DOH, and our engineering firm to come up with the appropriate remediation for this field. The current proposed plan, which appears will be approved by DEC and DOH, would have us bringing in one foot of clean fill, being able to utilize one existing foot of fill pr to ultimately provide a two foot protective cap over the plain surface. Um, of course, this is a field that would have to be maintained uh, forever at this point with a strict maintenance program that would be um, in compliance with DEC and DOH requirements. When it comes to looking at Mizarro's field, uh, the committee considered the options before them and through a seven to three vote, uh, the committee did determine that an artificial plane surface would best suit our needs. And, but the recommendation at their point or the preference was to consider organic or an, in, or an organic hybrid infill. Uh, we certainly will get into more conversation about that as the process moves forward. And finally, looking at Oli Track and that the committee felt that it was important to make sure we replace that with a new running surface. So when we look at those issues, those items, uh, we can see a cost summary of East Field, just over $1.2 million. Mazaros Field and Oli Track, just shy of $1.8 million. And I want to um, provide a footnote to that figure for Mazaros and Oli Track in that that um, 1.8 figure um, includes the hybrid organic infill. And we will show where there is an upcharge in the next slide if the board were to opt to go with a totally organic infill. So when we see a total cost for the proposed field expenses, we see a figure of just over $3 million. 
Along the way, there was other conversations and lights at Mazzaro's, while not necessarily recommended by the projects committee or the field committee, um, we had to, uh, there was questions that came from the board and the questions here um, certainly wanted to see the cost of lights from Mazzaro's, which are estimated to be $250,000. Lacrosse netting for the end zone areas of the fields at $30,000. A possible purchase of a storage shed for maintenance equipment and infill. Um, footnote here again um, that our architects are researching the possibility of expanding the existing tower to provide more storage space there as opposed to having to bring in a shed. Um, one recommendation was for the um, addition of bleachers on the home side of the field. Possibly some sprinklers for lower dowels, which again we're estimating at $10,000, but more engineering would have to be done to firm that figure. And if the board were to opt to go with an organic infill, no crumb rubber, we estimate an upcharge from the previous figure of $1.289 million, we would add another $80,000 to cover that premium charge. So when we think about the work that comes out of the facilities proposals and the discussion that we had just a week ago. The Buildings and Grounds Committee reviewed a number of projects and projects that um, are broken into maybe four categories, I think, of importance here. And looking at energy conservation, looking at preemptive, so looking at offsetting needs down the road, uh, quality of life recommendations, as well as two safety recommendations. Uh, it's important to note, as is noted on the screen, that the committee did not necessarily prioritize or rank order them, but did break projects into two different tiers for the board's consideration, with the first tier being items they would recommend be pursued at this time, and the second being items that could wait for future efforts. So with that said, you can certainly see an overview of projects. And when we look at tier one, um, you can certainly see there's a number of projects related to lighting in our schools, controlling the heat by providing upgraded heating controls, converting uh, boilers from oil to gas to see efficiencies there. Uh, but a couple other projects that stand out that are a little bit different than the others. If we look to the bottom four in tier one, moving the district offices to Dow's Lane. In doing so, we'd be able to uh, remove the existing modulars that are certainly well beyond their life. Um, we would relocate the nurse's office and the main office in Dow's Lane to the center of the school. Um, also provide ADA compliant uh, bathrooms in the nurse's office. Um, and in doing so, um, there would have to be some upgrades uh, for ADA compliance in the building. Um, looking at adding vestibules at the middle school, um, recognizing that there's a single door on each side to the lobby, and when the doors open, um, there's quite a bit of wind that just blows through. Um, we have issues maintaining uh, temperature comfortably in the building because of it, and there's much dirt and debris that finds its way in and is potentially damaging our uh, HVAC system at this point in time. Uh, the gym roofs at Main Street School are at their end of their useful life, so there is initiative to replace them, as well as looking at the Dust Bowl area, which is the lawn space between the middle school and the gym theater building, an area that currently is appropriately named the Dust Bowl because it is nearly covered with dirt much of the year. It does not provide our students with a safe place to play during the recess time, um, but also translates into some maintenance issues within the school building. So with that said, um, there are a number of other pro uh, projects that were considered in tier two, which you can see, uh, but those projects weren't necessarily being recommended at this point in time. So when we look at a sum for the tier one projects, we're looking at a figure just south of $2 million and tier two projects of, of $587,000. So uh, this illustration is just a sum to take a look at the scope of the work, where we're going to look at tier one, tier two, and consider where things may end up if the board were to opt to accept one series of recommendations and consider the costs of all the work that we discussed for our fields and track, we'd be in at a range of about $5 million. Certainly, uh, there is not a recommendation from administration at this point in time, uh, but the board is to uh, contemplate the scope of this bond and to consider uh, the necessity of the work and consider the financial implications related to, to the bonds. So when we take a, a step back and think about those financial considerations, we have to think where we are right now. At this point in time, we do have one bond that expires at the end of the 14-15 school year. And essentially, if the 
board was to decide to move forward with a bond and the community was to support it, we'd be in a position where some of the new costs would be offset by the expiring debt. So when we look at the expiring debt, you can kind of look just below the line of $3.5 million. Uh, that's sort of our break-even point as we look at it right now. So if there was to be a bond that was, say, $3.5 $3 million, you would see a debt service reduction of thirty-seven fifty-seven. If there was a bond of only $1.5 million, you would see a reduction of $181,000 a year. And when I'm talking about a reduction, I'm thinking about the debt service expenditures for the district. But once we move north or a number higher than $3.5 million, you can see the increases. And for example, $4.5 million, we would see an increase of $85,000. So with that said, we kind of bring us forward to where we are today. Conversation on some of the scope. Um, certainly conversation about Eastfield and dialogue about Mazzaro's track and possible facilities projects. When we look at to the next scheduled meeting, which is April 1st, we know that it, there's already going to be school district budget discussion. Um, but we need to be ambitious. We need to consider the scope of this work. And here I've highlighted a number of dates before us, I think, of great significance. And if we're looking to have a bond referendum vote by the end of September, which is necessary for us to be able to break ground in July 1 of 2015, we're really in a position where we have to make de uh, decisions almost immediately, recognizing that there's going to be questions asked tonight, research that's going to have to be performed and answers provided. Um, so with that said, um, board, Mr. Gratos, um, the conversation is now yours. Um, I would suggest that we look to the, the most pressing factors, which are East Field and the other field questions, and then potentially move in to facilities if there's time. No, I agree, and thank you, thank you for that presentation. The only other thing I'd like to add to this timeline is that the board, in light of the fact that there is an April 1, the April 1 meeting is also a budget meeting, we're also discussing having an April 9th meeting uh, just to be respectful of people's time and the need to answer any questions that come out of the, the presentations uh, that we've had, the, the issues tonight. Um, and, and so uh, the April 1st meeting may bleed over into the April 9th meeting as well because our goal is to answer everybody's questions to the best of our ability. Um, I'd like to open it up to the community for any questions regarding Eastfield, Mazaros, or the other uh, projects, um, with, with a, a couple um, a couple thoughts to start. Uh, one is, um, you know, many people have reached out to the board and to Dr. Harrison and the, the rest of the administration already with various questions and comments, and we thank everyone for those. Um, there are certain strings of, of uh, inquiry that we see in those comments. And so what we're going to do is, and I'm going to get into that in a second, but I've, I've sort of narrowed that down with the other board members of some sort of overarching questions that, you know, a lot of which, frankly, has been addressed, but uh, people still have questions on, and we want to make sure those questions get answered. So what I'm going to do is ask for the administration to get back to us regarding some, some global questions that I'll talk about now, and what we'll do is, since they seem to be questions that many, um, uh, community members have, we will recite the questions and uh, post our answers uh, to the website so that we make sure that everybody's operating off of the same, um, you know, same information. You know, tonight um, we're happy to answer any questions anybody has. Um, if you've been following along uh, with our fields discussions and projects discussions over the last two years, if you've saved every bit of information we've provided, you're going to have a binder about three inches thick, as we all do. So if we cannot answer a question immediately, we're not attempting to duck your question. We're not attempting to delay getting you a response to your question. But the goal is to get you a complete and intelligent answer to the question. So if it's not something we can answer really off the cuff this evening or through uh, the administration, the board, or our professionals here, uh, we will take that question and either um, post it as well to the uh, the website when we have it answered by the administration and our professionals or we will um, answer it at the next public meeting. Um, so to start off, I'd like to, and, and to the administration, you don't need to take notes, I'll send you 
a list of what we're thinking of, but in looking at comments we've received from the community uh, by email uh, to all of us to date, would like information on the following questions. Um, and the, again, these will be questions that we will also post uh, to the website once the answers are, are given. Uh, number one, uh, what is the difference in cost between a hybrid infill artificial field and a fully organic infill artificial field? Um, I know that in the presentation now, and I, I was doing these at work today, uh, Dr. Harrison just mentioned that that number is approximately $80,000, but we'll make sure that the community knows that number through this question. Um, secondly, uh, what is the cost of maintenance on an annual basis of the maintenance of a hybrid infill artificial field versus a fully organic infilled artificial field versus a pure grass field? Um, so we'd, we'd like information on that. And again, I know that at least with respect to these the grass versus the, the, uh, the hybrid, I believe we already have information on that, but we'll need to expand. Um, number three, um, we would like to get more information to the community confirming the usage hours that we have been talking about really now for two years with regard to our fields, the, the numbers of usage, the types of usage, the, the various organizations that use the field, um, and, and that was given to the fields uh, committee. I think we could put that and, and uh, narrow it down so everybody has that. Um, regarding, there, there's also been uh, talk about the, you know, what information has the board uh, received and looked at and our, our, the administration and professionals regarding the environmental and health issues regarding uh, artificial turf in general. Um, I could tell you that if you look at the research, and I've looked at, personally, I've, you know, I've been living with this for a couple of years now, most of the research that's out there is research dealing with the, uh, the, the granulated rubber infill. Uh, various um, governmental organizations from um, the federal level, the various New York State, New York City, the New York DEC, uh, there's also been um, many uh, studies from um, other governmental uh, entities such as Connecticut, New Jersey, California have done multiple ones of these. Uh, the board's been provided uh, with, with all of these and, and uh, um, ha has looked at all of those. Um, I, I'm not aware, I don't know if we necessarily need to answer this on, um, on, the, uh, on the website, but suffice it to say that we've looked at every um, um, you know, study done by governmental agencies that would be applicable here. Um, and with the further caveat that clearly in looking at those studies, um, at least uh, with respect to what's been presented to the board, uh, we are looking away from doing a pure um, rubber, crumb rubber infill and looking more towards organic, which we believe is much more acceptable to the, the residents of Irvington uh, and frankly, um, you know, as a parent, much more acceptable to me. So, um, but if anybody has any other questions on that or wants to provide us with any more materials, we're happy to look at them. Um, there was also questions regarding um, the Mazeros drainage issue um, and how do we know where the water's coming from, et cetera, et cetera. Are we getting hit from uh, water coming off the hill from the the Deerman Park residents. I know that it, uh, I believe it was the last meeting of the meeting before Lan uh, addressed that drainage issue, but we're happy to get more information on that. Um, and then the final thing is, you know, whether have we looked at um, since the Dow's Lane fields have been, you know, the, the, the bulk of the extra use um, from Eastfield being closed and our issues with Mazaros have, have fallen down upon the fields at Eastfield, I mean, the fields at Dow's Lane. You know, have we looked at um, uh, what are the likely costs to bring the Dow's Lane fields back and help restore them and, and maintain them the best we can? I think part of that has been addressed in uh, the uh, uh, recommendation by the Fields Committee and also something that the board has been uh, looking at in uh, trying to uh, look at the costs of the water and uh, sprinkler system for, uh, for the Dow's Lane fields. And, and, and so we're, but we're happy to provide additional information on that. The one thing that, that I've heard 
that I want to um, sort of end the speculation on because I think it's, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's you know, there's, there's, there's uh, I said before, there's law and there's lore. Law is what the law is and lore is if people keep saying it enough, suddenly people start thinking it's the law. Um, there's been some question that somehow LAN is, uh, just to be frank, pushing the board or the administration towards an artificial turf field because they're financially, uh, uh, somehow <laughs> they would benefit financially from that. Um, and, and there's been some call for the board to, and the administration to, to talk to the community about LAN's role and what the, the financial uh, uh, relationship is. Um, I first want to say that you know, we've been dealing with land for about two years on these issues and even when we found out about the, the issue on Eastfield and I've never seen nothing but the utmost professionalism from land as an organization, um, nor have I ever seen land try to sway the board or the administration and I've been on 98% of these calls to taking a position or not. Um, what land has done has told us what our options are, they've told us what other districts have done and they've left it for us to decide. Um, so in, in not a single time have I seen land try to sway us one way or another for any decision. And all that being said, land's financial relationship with the district is a pure percentage uh, as is typical and customary for a uh, type of organization like land architects dealing with school districts of similar, uh, with similar projects. It's a straight percentage, it's 5%. Um, whether we choose grass, whether we choose um, uh, turf, whether we choose peanut shells, whether we choose to do nothing and just put up, you know, whatever we choose as the scope of our project, they're paid a percentage. They get no more from the district for choosing grass versus turf versus peanut shells. So I want to uh, dispel uh, any conversation about that. I think it's, it, it takes away from the issues really before us and what we need to determine as a community. Um, and, and to start uh, stating that people are uh, trying to sway certain people because of bogus financial uh, incentives, I think, is, is, uh, is just not proper. Um, so that's it. I will get to the administration those questions in email form, and I guess we'll work on uh, preparing something for the community to answer uh, all of those things. Um, at this point, I'd like to open uh, the microphone to the community. Uh, you know, the same rules you always have as apply. would like you to, uh, you know, limit your questions or comments to three minutes for those that have just come in. Um, there's a lot of information here. Um, we are not, I don't have it all memorized. None of, us have it all memori none, of it, none of us have it all memorized. We're not trying to duck your question. We're not trying to avoid your question. You will get an answer. You may not get your answer tonight, you, but you will have it either through the website or directly or uh, at the next public meeting. Uh, we want to answer your questions. Please do not think if we cannot answer it that we're avoiding it or we're ducking it because that's just not the case. Uh, so if you could please say your name uh, when you, you step to the uh, microphone and we'll go from there. Sorry for being so long-winded. And the mic is uh, back there. Hello, uh, my name is Eric Oley. Uh, I have an issue with page five of the Fields Project Committee report. Uh, I guess it's page five and it's also n uh, numeral five uh, and subnumeral one when it says, widen the delineated plain field striping on the Zaris to accommodate a regulation size men's lacrosse field. This will require removing the 206 foot runway in the D zone. I mean, what is a D zone? Uh, and what we'll do here, it might be a little bit free form, but to the extent that our, uh, our professional from land would answer, um, we'll, we'll just have him answer directly, please. The D zone is the end of the uh, football field that is bound by the, the curve of the track. So if you were looking at it air, from an aerial view from the blimp, it literally looks like a D. And it's called the D zone? Let's it's, it. yes. And uh, you're and going to eliminate that runway. And, and that was, in the last presentation, that was verbally corrected. The intent is to move it to the D zone, not from the D zone. Currently, the runways are run parallel with the, the straightaway of the track. So the, the, the school would like to, or the fields committee has recommended 
in the recommendations to the remove it from there. And the pole vault runways? Correct. Be on the end of the track? Yes. Running uh, east and west instead of north and south? Yes. That's not a long enough distance? Mm -hmm. It is. No, it's not. In the interior of the track, the exterior of the track? In the interior of the track. You can have a pole vault runway run in the interior of the track and not bisect the field in any way? No, it would be behind the football goal post, if you will, between there and the curve of the track. And there's, a, there's enough regulation length there? And Correct. Check that, rate, that length with the proper guidelines? Yes. What about the high jump apron? The high jump is currently exists okay. in the D zone. So you wouldn't move the high jump at all? That's correct. Okay. I, I mean, I don't understand how it makes sense, but I will, I will look into that. Because I don't see how you have the distance there to do a Paul Walter or a long jump. But thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions or comments from the community, please? Sir. Thomas uh, Jackson, I uh, was uh, am one of the uh, members of the uh, Fields Project Committee, and I wondered if I could address some comments to the board in that capacity. Uh, the last uh, time that we had occasion to speak on these issues, we were dealing with some of the environmental and health questions. What I thought perhaps it was worth discussing tonight was the uh, uh, cost comparison issues between artificial turf and a natural grass field. And just as a, uh, as a point of reference for that, there was a, uh, there was a uh, slide part of the uh, slide presentation in connection with the uh, field project committee report. And uh, the same information also appears in the report itself. It's called a uh, 10 and 20 year illustrative cost analysis. And the questions that arose, just to explain a little bit, the, all of the committee members saw the, this, uh, the, the information in prior versions of this chart very late in the process. And we had a very, very short time as a committee within which to work. But we were given the opportunity, based on earlier iterations of the same document, to, uh, to uh, uh, ask questions, uh, not even so much in the forum of a, uh, a committee meetings themselves. We had really no time left at that point, but rather in submitting questions which the administration in turn passed on to or discussed with uh, land and gave us some answers. So, uh, what what was striking uh, to us was that when you compare that cost analysis uh, to the information that was presented to the board in December 2012, there were a number of fairly dramatic differences. Uh, we had asked that for purposes of this presentation, instead of presenting the information the same way that it had been presented to the board, that the information be presented in the form of a 10 and 20 year cost comparison, as opposed to simply focusing on the initial installation cost or even an annual maintenance figure. And uh, the result of that was that it provided a somewhat different picture in terms of the relative costs of the two approaches. But then, at least when some of us drilled down a little bit deeper, it left us with some questions. And I'll, I'll just run through this very quickly. And uh, uh, as the board has an opportunity to look at this further, it would be easiest if you also had in front of you a copy of the 
counterpart to that, the slide that was part of the uh, December uh, uh, 2012 presentation. But just to summarize a few of the points, uh, the uh, installation cost of a natural turf field, we're talking about a period of about 14, 15 months or so. Uh, the installation cost of a natural turf field, uh, as between the two presentations, was increased uh, between $465,000 and $535,000 to $743,000. So an increase of somewhere between $208,000 and $278,000. Uh, the installation cost of a synthetic turf field remained approximately the same in the two comparisons. The annual maintenance cost of a natural turf field was increased from $20,000 a year to $25,000 a year, which was an increase of 25 percent. Uh, the uh, annual maintenance cost of an artificial turf field was shown to be more or less the same. There were different options that were presented, but for this purpose, uh, uh, somewhere in the area of five to $6,000 uh, a year. So we asked some questions about the installation costs, and we had gotten some uh, answers to that, but it really, left us to ask the question, what changed between the two presentations? So that was one of the areas of focus. And uh, again, just to be clear about this, uh, this was done in email exchanges. Uh, uh, emails sent to the two co-chairs, uh, to the uh, two members of the administration, and they in turn, I take it, used LAN as a resource in order to be able to respond to so, just so I understand, your, your first question is, what is the difference between the estimates from two years ago on the grass surface field versus what the estimate is now? The installation costs. The installation costs. Oh, that's something we can obviously get you an answer on. And then the second thing was to look at a particular line item, which was the addition of $125,000 in the 10th uh, year another $125,000 in the 20th year uh, to the cost of a grass field, which was explained as subsurface drainage modification and replacement. And to the, we asked for additional information on that. We were given the information. But essentially what we were told was over time, the drainage lines clog and become infiltrated with root material. We were told that land had conferred with installers and manufacturers, which I assume means uh, uh, manufacturers of uh, artificial turf, and the companies that install it. No, that would be with respect to grass. We're still talking about grass, right? Well, I don't think there were any manufacturers of grass, so the reference was conferring with manufacturers, oh, manufacturers of drainage systems. I mean, it didn't read that way in the context, but I accept it. Okay. In any event, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the sense uh, was that uh, the drainage pipes are made of PVC plastic. The uh, distance uh, uh, set is approximately uh, uh, three feet, a little less than three feet below the field surface. And uh, the... Uh, Roots, grass roots, uh, travel a lateral distance of about six to nine inches. So we were a little bit unclear about why an additional $250,000 of cost was being added uh, for that point. Uh, the third question arose with regard to the cost of irrigation and watering. Uh, there are no watering costs that are associated with the uh, figures for an artificial turf field in the uh, field project committee report in the slide presentation. But in reality, artificial turf needs to be watered, especially if the water is used instead of chemicals. And organic and hybrid infill fields need to be watered to maintain the moisture content. So if organic infill or hybrid infill is used, it's necessary to water them regularly because the pork and other organic materials dry out. I'll leave out for, that, for this purpose the fact that if there were 
a firm rubbery in fill field, you would also have the issue with regard to water to reduce temperature. So uh, it, was, it was a bit confusing because if there are labor costs and other costs, infrastructure costs with regard to uh, uh, the irrigation for a, a natural grass field, then it seemed to us there should be at least some cost associated with regard to the water of uh, an uh, artificial uh, turf uh, field. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the only other point on that score, and we want quickly to something else, but the only other point on that score is that some of us felt that the process suffered because of the fact that we really did not have anyone who was a natural grass expert. We had at least one member of the committee who has great expertise in that area. And uh, I know that Land tried to identify someone who could supply that uh, information and fulfill that role. Uh, time was very short. Uh, one, of our, one of our members, after uh, seeing the, uh, the uh, uh, final uh, report, uh, was able to identify someone. And the information that they provided, quite informally, uh, it was very interesting, and it, 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 it is so integral to the question before your board as to field utilization, recovery time for uh, natural grass fields, uh, drainage with regard to natural grass fields, how long it takes to grow a natural grass field, how long it has to be arrested. These are really four questions, and, and I, I don't don't mean to be presumptuous, but I assume these are questions that would be very much the focus of your board and its deliberations. Uh, suffice it to say that a very different picture was painted. Uh, this was information from a very credible expert, a consultant. It was, I don't know exactly if your board has the interest and we can identify who that is. It might be worth hearing from you. However you do it, your time is short, I appreciate that, and it's late in the process to raise this. But on the other hand, we were seeing a lot of that information very late, and it was on a very, very short time. Uh, on, so on, on that point, I, I can tell you, and I understand that, that, that we put uh, uh, a lot of pressure on, on, on the board, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, on the committee to, to, to review uh, the information and, and provide recommendations, but um, the, the fields issue in Irvington has been going on for a long time. Um, we have had, over the last couple of years, uh, and since I've been on the board for the past four, at various, or three and a half for the various times, spoken to various uh, natural grass experts who have provided us their opinions. So if, you, if your expert would like to provide us an opinion, we're happy to hear it. Uh, we're not shying away from any of that. In fact, we're trying to get as much information as possible. Um, the natural grass experts that we've heard and, and, and the administration and various board members have spoken to over the years uh, have felt that due to our usage um, that uh, uh, natural grass on Mazeros Field is not the most cost effective and best option. So if, if there's other information, we're happy to hear it. I appreciate that. So we will share that with, Thank you. Uh, with the board. I just have and, a question, uh, Did you... Uh, sure. Did you... Did, what, this, was this expert... Did he, did he provide uh, any, any written commentary? Or he was did it not provide a, 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 a consultant's report. He wasn't engaged as a consultant. Right. We were attempting to find out, or one of, one of our members of the committee, it was not I, uh, was attempting to find out uh, essentially what his views were, because this is his life's work. And uh, he provided those views. Uh, they were reduced to a summary. A couple of emails that I've seen just exchange internally. They were not emails to the board. And at least for a starting point, it might be helpful to share that information and then to see uh, what can be found out. I, I, I don't know in the prior situations whether these were experts who were acting as consultants and paid a consulting fee. I don't know what this individual or his company would be looking for. We really didn't get to that point. And, and I think ultimately, uh, that that is uh, that is uh, your board school, so it was not our intention to intrude on that either. But the information, nonetheless, uh, was dramatically different from what was discussed. And I appreciate that you've gone through this on a number of prior uh, go rounds. 
Uh, we had quite a bit of material, as I'm sure you know, that was made available to the committee members uh, in the form of a document repository, a Dropbox repository. And uh, 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 we poured over that and even looked at some of the resources on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, the uh, school district's website and uh, did a lot of our research, research of our own, posted documents there, but uh, uh, to be very candid, we didn't see that. It wasn't brought to our attention, and, and therefore it was really not part of the deliberations of the committee. So those were the comments that I wanted to share, and anything that, anything that I or any of our colleagues can do that would be helpful in your deliberations, we would, we would very much like to do that. But, but, Tom, my follow-up is just, can you send the email that, because you said he provided a summary uh, to, to you, to the committee? Yeah. Surely, the emails were actually notes taken by Esther Samrose, one, uh, one of our committee members, uh, based on two conversations that she had. I I'd be happy to share those. And uh, at that point, I can ask her to make some further inquiry, uh, or if there is an interest, perhaps, Perhaps the, uh, the board might want to ask that that inquiry be made. I don't know that we're the most appropriate ones to be doing sure. that. But no, uh, thank that's, you. that's essentially what, uh, what I'm And I, I just want to recap for all of us here. Here's what we're going to get back to you on. Um, you want an explanation of the difference in the installation costs from two years ago versus now. Um, clarity around the $250,000 increase uh, for the drainage. And... Um, uh, why the cost of irrigation slash water uh, was omitted from the numbers regarding artificial turf. Those are the, those are the Thank you. We'll get back to you on those, sir. Ma'am. Hi. Uh, my name is Ann Atchison, and I also am a member of the Fields Project Committee, <clears throat> and I wrote you a letter um, which I'm not going to read because it's very long, which, which expressed some of my concerns um, about the fact that the, the field project committee had a very short amount of time, as we've emphasized. And um, some of the information was hard to, at least for me, to get my mind around because I'm not used to thinking about things like field usage. And um, I think that, to me, there's a two... The first thing I'd like to say is that the report states in it that something like some of the people who voted against artificial turf, one of whom was me, um, voted, thought that there should be natural grass regardless of how the fields were being used. And um, I sent an email to the authors of the report saying that that wasn't true, that wasn't my view. And so I'd like to start out by saying my view is not grass no matter what. My view is that gra four grass fields in good condition can support the program for both the, high s the schools and the community. And I, so I think that the two pronged pieces of information that need to come out in a much clearer form than, than has so far are what is the realistic field usage of a natural grass field in terms of hours per week or hours per season. And that gets to something what Tom said, which is what is resting um, and layer that onto the fact that modern grass has changed a lot from grass 30 years ago. And there's a lot more known about how to grow good grass and what seeds to choose and so forth. And um, so you can't go by what it even looked like five years ago. You have to open your mind to the fact that there's new technology and there's even technology like hydro seeding and pre-germination where the grass seed when it lands on the dirt will sprout the next day. So you just have to open your mind to the fact that maybe there's a new way of looking at grass in terms of how you use it. But the main, the main issue I have is with the way that field usage is talked about. And the committee was given quite a number of different ways of looking at this from the athletic department. And, um, and 
I think, unfortunately, um, it's very tempting to simplify hours of usage by just adding up every hour that the fields are used and saying, we need to use the fields 4,000 hours or whatever the number is. And then divide that by how many hours you think you can use whatever it is that the surface is and say we need seven fields. And I think that by including the, the analysis that Scott Hughes put, did, the one page thing that was in the report, the fields committee didn't do you or the community any favors because I think if you start to take a deep dive into field usage, and I respect that you've probably done this a lot and many other people have as well, but I think that realistically you, you have to think of a variety of different variables. For example, the east field would be online. So you charged us with saying the baseline condition is east field restored to good grass, Mazaros restored to good grass. So if you had four good grass fields to play on, how would you deploy these fields? Give us a schedule of that. And I think the athletic department did do that, and I've looked carefully at it. And in my letter, I gave you an example of the fact that the football team is scheduled to practice on East Field. And there's three teams, and they all practice on East Field. But East Field can only be used for 3.5 hours a weekday at the end of the day. Yet they need to practice for a total of 5.5 hours. So what that tells me is, when, and which is true and perfectly logical, is that more than one team practices on a field at once. Mm -hmm. And certainly when you have youth soccer and whatnot, more than one kid's team can practice on a field at once. So when you look at field usage, let's use the football team, the field has been used for three and a half hours. The total hours is 5.5. So when you, when you just total the hours, in some cases, that team is the only team practicing on that field, and that's fine. But when the field usage adds up to more than the hours that are available in that 3.5 hours, that means that more than one team is playing at once. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage you, it's very difficult. I and ma'am, I'm, I'm not trying to cut you off. Please. I want you to finish your thought. But you may have missed my introductory comments. One of the things we did before opening up the... I, I didn't miss it. I just want to emphasize. Oh, okay, because we, we're, we, we, we are asking the administration, based upon your very thoughtful letter, to give us that exact information and give you that exact information. Okay. So, I mean, I've tried to look at it different ways, and I also just want to add one quick thing, and then I'll stop, which is the whole thing is complicated by the fact that I, I understand, and I may be wrong, that um, only one field is big enough to play regulation sports of certain kinds, and that's Mazzaro's like boys soccer or something like that, and football mm -hmm. and whatnot. So what you see when you look at what the athletic department ha handed out to the committee is that there's a lot of convergence of games onto the Mazaros field because of its size. So one thing that I think that the community and you as a board should think about, is there any way to take some of the pressure off of that by, say, enlarging lower Dow's Lane field and or, and making it into a regulation size field so that because a whole bunch of this usage um, problem, if you believe there is a problem, has to do with the fact that soccer can practice somewhere else, but then it has to come onto the Mazzaro's field to right. play its game. Right. Thank you very much. I'm Eileen Watts, and as uh, some of you may recollect from uh, my comments at the last meeting I attended, uh, I believe that artificial turf is a threat to health, safety, and the environment. And I do believe that if the school board makes a strategic decision to include it in this bond boat, I do believe there's a good chance that the whole package will be defeated. My question is, that I'm wondering, and again, I don't attend all these meetings, but I'm, this is a question out to the school board, is how broad is your strategic lens when you look at the next 10 to 20 years of the Irvington community? So for example, um, I understand, and I may be wrong, that the school population is declining. Uh, there's a birth dearth. 
There are fewer people. Uh, uh, Hastings is more popular than Irvington, I've read. Um, there are um, uh, Main Street School, I heard discussions, though it was voted down, about you know, vacating Main Street School and perhaps selling it. Has there been thought to what the next 10 and 20 years is going to hold for Irvington? You know, is it possible to think if we know that eventually Main Street School will be vacated, is it possible to tear it down and use that land for fields as an example? Another question which to me relates to the bigger picture is, and I don't know the answer to this, is many school districts uh, from a financial perspective never accrued uh, on a year-to-year on -year basis uh, their pension costs uh, and related expenses, pensions and benefits. I don't know if Irvington has or hasn't, um, but if they haven't, then that's a, a cost of the future that's uh, coming up to be borne by the you know, next generation of Irvington residents. And don't we need to take this all into account you know, when making decisions, health, safety, and the environment, uh, future population, the cost that the future residents of Irvington will bear, you know, along with making the decisions of today, how many hours of field usage we require. Um. You said a lot there, um, and, and without turning it into a long conversation, um, I could tell you on behalf of this board, um, all of us live in Irvington. I have three children in the school district. Um, I pay a lot of taxes. Phil Whitney is a lifelong resident of Irvington. Maria Cashkin has three children in the district. Mr. Montgomery, as you know, is a long-term resident of the district that has had two children in the district. Uh, Robin Kerner has th uh, two children in the district, three currently in the district, also a long-term resident. So I, I disagree vehemently with your assumption that we're not looking at the long-term future of Irvington uh, and our, all of our property values uh, when we're making these decisions. We don't make any of these things lightly, ma'am. My youngest is in, just getting into kindergarten um, we don't take any of it lightly. Um, so I don't, I don't know how to answer your question other than to say, of course we have. Well, I guess the question is, what is the answer? Well, the, the answer is what we're proposing. You know, we're, we're five elected. That is your narrow proposal, but my question is, have you addressed the bigger long term? Of course we have. Of course we have. And, and you know, the. Do you want me to predict what the state well, you legislature is what going to do? That's not true. We're, <laughs> our, our, our accrual of the expense and what we're allowed to reserve for is a completely different uh, conversation. And, and it really has nothing to do with the current fields vote. I, I can tell you that we all understand the bigger picture. It's not new to us. Um, okay, I, I can't answer that for you. Thank you. Bob, can I just? Of course. One thing. Um, you know, you did mention your concerns over health and um, <coughs> safety and, did you say, environmental issues. Um, you know, I think that's something where I do feel like, and I hope we're going to get that as part of our, our information requests, more information on that. I know that there are a lot of studies out there, but it's, it's a little hard to kind of pull that together and, and see it in one place. And I don't know if there's a way to do that in some way. But, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I took a quick look at some. There, there are, you know, seem to be some concerns about heat in certain types of artificial turf, and that's more an issue with players. Mm -hmm. But that's, I think, at least the literature is on chrome rubber, which is not what we're talking about at all. Uh, I don't think we know clearly what the heat issues are in some of the other options. Uh, we know that we think they're less, but, yeah, they're, but yeah. I don't know if we know that very precisely. <coughs> uh, but I would certainly, I think it's very important, because a lot of people in the community have concerns, founded or not, on these issues. And just to get all the data and information together so people can... No, and, and one of the things... Yeah, you're absolutely right. One, yeah, it, well, good point taken. Um, what we've asked 
uh, both uh, our, uh, our, our consultants uh, to do and we'll prepare as part of our um, uh, answers to the community. Um, Penn State University is really one of the leaders in uh, research regarding uh, grass turf and also uh, artificial turf. They have an amazing website that um, sets forth or uh, as part of their school, all of their own studies as well as um, studies regarding artificial turf. Um, and it pains me to say that as a Michigan man, but um, they, they do a very good job and, and really have a, a great website which amasses not only their own research, but also the research of the various federal and state and local governments from across the United States. So that's what's out there, folks. I mean, I, I, I'm happy to, we will put that website uh, on the um, uh, on our uh, on our website to answer that question, as well as any reports on that that exist regarding um, the artificial turf, uh, either the hybrid or the um, uh, fully organic infill that we're considering. Um, I, I tend to think uh, that there's not much out there because it's a newer product, other than ones that are produced by the sellers of that material, which well, I'm, I'm skeptical about, but we'll put those on. Take them with a grain of info. Absolutely. Still want to have them. Right, uh, exactly right. And we'll, we'll provide all of that, but anybody interested, yeah. if you just put in artificial turf in Penn State into Google, you will go to their website, and it is an amazing resource of information going back uh, 20, 30, 25 years, and a lot of very recent um, uh, materials from Connecticut, California, Jersey, New York State, New York City, um, all dealing with the ramifications mainly of, because this all goes around, it's, the, the discussion is around the infill, all talking about the uh, environmental effects uh, of the, uh, the, 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 the rubber infill. Yeah. And Bob, I think we, you know, I would encourage anybody who feels like they have other information other Absolutely. Studies, to, you know, forward them to us. I don't think any of us want to make a decision that's going to endanger anybody's health or, or no. a, a village environment or anything like that, but we just have to deal with the best information we can find uh, and make the best judgment we can. So, you know, I, I don't, we'd all be crazy not to right. ignore something that somebody would bring to our attention. Um, can I just address one other, one other part of that comment? Um, the, I mean, the, the serious long-term issue is not exactly pensions, it's, it's retiree health care cost, which we, we are, I think, are obligated to pay, do, to fund on a pay-as-you-go basis, meaning we pay this year the current retiree costs, and 20 years we'll pay the retiree cost for whoever, who's ever retired then. Yeah. And that's all fine. The pay-as-you-go pay systems, I think, work fine as long as you don't start shrinking greatly. If you start shrinking greatly, we're, we'll get into big, big fiscal trouble having to support as did Detroit and General Motors, by having to support uh, a lot more retirees than we have active workers uh, and active students and residents. So in the biggest way we can avoid that is to keep a vibrant community where people are attracted to this community as a place to bring their kids and educate their kids. And I think the way to do that is to make sure that in all aspects of our schools are as, as good as they can be and as attractive as they can be to uh, prospective families. So I think that's part of what we're after here is to figure out how to do that in a sustainable and, and cost-effective way. Uh, very, I couldn't have said it any better myself. That's exactly right. And I think that's been the backdrop of the board's work um, from um, the start of looking at the fields. Um, all of us moved to Irvington, at least myself, for the schools. And we have to remember that our schools are two things. There are facilities and there are teachers. That's what a school is. And uh, because we've said this in prior meetings, but because of the tax cap legislation and because of the, the budget pressures over the past five to six, seven, eight years, uh, we have tried to maintain, and I believe we have maintained, um, good schools in Irvington, but what has, where we have lacked is in keeping our facilities up, both our fields and our buildings. Um, the, the board believes that now's the time to move forward, and that's why we've presented and will present, hopefully, a bond to the community that will deal with both with our building needs, uh, our immediate building needs, and what we see as our immediate uh, fields needs. Sir. 
Hi, I'm Michael Hanna. I was uh, also on the fields committee. Uh, and I would say I came in uh, without uh, a sense of one way or the other. I haven't uh, been deeply ensconced in the issue previously and uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to learn a lot about the issue and, and we had a tremendous amount of material. I, I certainly was interested to hear as much as possible about all the different issues, environmental health, uh, and as we hear over and over again, use. Uh, and uh, I think you know that's one that keeps coming back up. How much are we using our fields? How are we using them? If there's only 3.5 hours in a day and we have 5.5 hours of football practice, is that less use or more when you have hundreds of feet on the field? Uh, you know, we can debate all these details, but I, I do encourage you, if, since if we don't feel like we have good natural grass information in terms of how much it can withstand, to find out. Because if we can't comfortably handle the use with natural grass, it's not a choice between artificial turf and natural grass. It's a choice between a system that succeeds or a system that fails, and that's the investment. Uh, but more to the point is that uh, I think you know this better than I, every time you open up a, a, a conversation about this, it feels like a restart. And when I look at the schedule and the bond vote being on September 23rd, I feel like you're giving yourself a very short window to address this topic yet again when you're asking people to vote on it. And I, I'm just concerned about how we'll successfully make sure people have a good awareness of you know, whatever your views about what the issues are in a sincere uh, way that, you know, that doesn't, you know, it's, very, it's clear it's very easy just to start throwing out details that may or may not be correct. And uh, coming into September of next year, uh, I'm curious to hear how we'll be successful in getting the word out to people about the issue. Yeah, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, a lot of what is pushing our thinking about this timeline is the fact that the fields issue in Irvington has been going on for years. Um, the fact that knowing that even if we um, you know, hold to this schedule, the soonest our fields are going to come online is late 2015. Um, if we were to delay it, we're just delaying, you know, beyond the schedule, we're just delaying it for at least an additional year because of the, when you, in the way, and it's just so everybody knows, the way this was done is the administration and our, our, our uh, consultants understand the various levels with respect to, to Eastfield, for instance, the DEC approvals that need to happen. And then with respect to all of our projects, the SED approvals that need to happen, the village approvals that need to happen, and how long all of that takes. So we don't just set a, a sort of a line in the sand. What we're trying to do is if we, and, and obviously it's best to do this work during, you know, at least with respect to the fields during the summer so you don't have a bunch of kids running around when you're bringing trucks and, and stuff up and down. Um, so you work backwards. And, and so this is the schedule that you get when you're working backwards. If we decided to do this two and a half years from now, it would have been a much different schedule. Um, you know, as, as to your point of um, getting the information out clearly and intelligently, um, you know, that's really why I started off. I think that we've um, provided a lot of information. You know, I've been doing this long enough that I literally have no idea how many people watch this stuff on television. I have my own thoughts about that, but I really have no idea. I tend to think not many. Um, and, you know, just, just like budget votes in Irvington, people tend to pay a lot of attention in the three weeks leading up to the vote. Um, so we're doing our best in every means possible to get the information out. Um, if you have any ideas about how we could do that, um, I know you were great, uh, and others with respect to the last budget vote would like to do it. Um, but, you know, we, we have been as, uh, you know, to use a bit of a pejorative term, open kimono as possible about our, our deliberations and the facts and, and and hopefully that comes through and now that we're starting to get a reaction uh, both positive and inquisitive you know from the community as, as to different facts like we got tonight we want to present those in a very organized intelligent and ambiguous way so that people's questions are answered and, and we'll continue to answer questions until everybody's questions are answered and people are comfortable in one way or the other. I would also add, um, from a communica communications committee perspective, um, Robin Kerner isn't here tonight, my fellow committee member, but we will be taking this up very soon in terms of how exactly we're going to present this information 
in a more concise fashion. Um, I think um, our website, irvingtonschools.org, because it has a lot of information already, is maybe not the best place just to dump all the fields information. Um, what Hastings did, and it obviously didn't work very well for them in terms of that vote, but what they did that was smart is I think they created actually a separate website so it was clear that this was a separate place for all this information. And as you probably know, setting up uh, a WordPress site is very easy and we could probably do that uh, for this um, information. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Linda Pierpont. I was also on the Fields Project Committee. And I just want to speak very briefly to the athletic component of this discussion because varsity sports started two weeks ago. And not none of the outdoor varsity sports that play on a field have obviously practiced outside yet, so they're in a gym. And they're going to go to their first varsity sport contest, most of them, having never been outside. Um, the varsity boys and JV boys lacrosse team played on a brand new turf field in Briarcliff today for a scrimmage. And that was their way to get a practice in outside. I forget when their actual first official game is, sometime next week, I believe. But when we talk about usage, we're also forgetting that we live in an area where we have no control over our weather, and we have bad weather a lot, and this one was particularly bad. So I don't think any of our fields are playable yet, already. Um, and having an artificial turf field, one in our community would help lot, many, many teams have home contests over the course of the fall and the spring, which we lose sometimes. And not just athletes lose them. Everybody's heard my spiel about the marching band who comes back on August 15th from their vacation, just like the football players, and starts rehearsing and practicing and getting ready. And when the teams get bused to play at someone's artificial turf, the band doesn't necessarily get to go because it's not in the budget to send that bus. So they've come home and they don't get to perform or be in a contest. Um, secondly, the idea of heat and artificial turf. Um, two of my three children have played helmet sports, lacrosse and football, at camps in July and August, Penn State being one of the places, Mr. Graydon. And um, <laughs> all coaches and school administrators and athletic directors are totally versed in when you have to take kids off a field that is too warm. And whether it's natural or artificial turf, New York State has a guideline and a temperature that you can't even have them on the field. If it's beautiful, lush green grass, they still can't go out. So although I hear and respect that, yes, artificial turf may get hotter than, or, than grass, people are very, very educated now when you take young athletes off of turf fields. And my last statement to all of this is all of Westchester County is going to at least having one artificial turf field for their varsity contests. We've upgraded our athletics, I mean our arts and our, well our athletics, our gyms are beautiful, and our academics so much over the years I've had children in this district. And it's time to upgrade the athletic fields a little. And I really think people who are against artificial turf are going to be against artificial turf. And maybe there can be some opening of minds on that also. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any other comments, questions from the community? Uh, Eric Ole again. Um, getting back to the, the runway question, uh, it seems that 45 meters is sufficient. But I would just add, suggest that since we're now changing uh, the runway to a, the east and west bias, the sun is going to play a role different times during the day. It's quite, you can pull ball, you can't pull ball into the sun, obviously. So I would suggest that you have a dual landing area on either side of the runway so that you can switch it if need be, if the meet is at the end of the day, or if you have a morning meet and then you want to go the other way. So uh, to me, that, that would make sense and should be thought about ahead of time. Thank you. It's a good idea. We have space for that? We'll look at it. OK, we'll look at it. Thank you. Or, or just somehow a way to. Um, move the landing area on top of a runway and make the runway longer. Yeah, we'll have to, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Somebody, maybe there's a way to be creative mm -hmm. about that. Okay, I, I see no other comments. Um, at this point, what I'd like to do 
is move on to uh, the next item, um, which is the adoption of the Eastfield remediation option as presented in the, the resolution. I did, as I mentioned, um, have a conversation, even though Robin Kerner uh, is uh, not here tonight, and obviously she cannot vote. Uh, I did have a conversation with her, and she fully supports the adoption of this uh, remedial option uh, this evening. I thought we might have a little time to just kind of discuss some of the things and um, the subject we just had, or, or do you want to do that? I'm going to find the order. Or well, all of the things we were just talking about and what you just said, we didn't really have a time to react. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah I, I, I thought, yeah, listen, any reaction is fine. I mean, I thought more of this was to take questions and respond to the community, but if you have a reaction, it's fine. Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I do. Well, um, yeah, so I was just jotting, jotting notes as I went along. I just want to just go through them and see if there's anything. Um, Oh, the other thing on the list of uh, list of information that I felt I don't know if this I'm close enough here that I felt I wanted was uh, that I, Bob I didn't hear you say was uh, information on on the key aspects of the warranties of the two competing uh, environmental product uh, two oh, artificial that, product that that was on product. that was on the supplemental email you sent me and I, I forgot to bring yeah, it yeah it's uh, yeah okay well that's what it is yeah the, the, okay. yeah i think that because the, that's yeah. critical because if we're talking about a 8 year or 10 year product especially one that's you know as new as the the pure organic infill we right. want to we want to have the we want to be able to rely on that warranty and know what it what it can give no, us. Well, 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 good point, and we'll add that. Uh, I could tell you that through the research I've seen, uh, the warranties tend to be eight to ten years. Yeah, but we want to know what what, yep. what they involve in terms of um, you know do's and don'ts, also major do's and don'ts. Um, And um, that's fine. I, I think we'll, um, as we go forward, we'll have some more discussion about what, what the nature of this bond will look like. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, stuff absolutely. Like that. So I'll defer um, those questions. Um, yeah, okay. That, I think that's enough for now. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we, uh, let's see, Mr. Whitney disappeared. <laughs> I think we're gonna have to wait for him to come back to uh, to do the. We, we have more power now. Let's just go. Well, well, look at that. Yeah. We've... <laughs> of course, ma'am. Um, Artie, can you clarify for me which contests can be played at Upper Dows? So currently, we play field hockey there, and we play soccer there, and we will play lacrosse there as well. Lacrosse girls, as it being a different sport in terms of contact, is a little easier to play there than if we were to play it. We have not played a varsity boys lacrosse game down there just because of the proximity of, of some of the, uh, the padding in the walls. And okay. there's just more contact involved. And varsity boys soccer can be played at Upper Downs? We have played it there. We actually had to host a sectional game two falls ago, the year we had the snowstorm in October. And Mazaros Field wasn't ready, so we actually hosted it uh, down there. Um, it wasn't ideal, but it was. Uh, you know, a, a varsity sectional game that we were able to play as a semifinal game there. Now, when you when you say not, I'm sorry, John. Uh, when you say not ideal, that was because lack of bleachers, lack of concessions, yeah, stand, of standing room only on one side. Right. Um, it's 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 tight. It's 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 it doesn't allow for much. You know, yeah, there's uh, not much room to stand there on, on the, the sides. Side. So I'm down there um, for soccer, but. Just to be clear for the community, yeah, the it is regulation. The, the dimensions of the field itself, putting aside actually people watching the game, yeah, the, the dimensions of the field itself are regulation for both lacrosse and soccer. Yeah, there's actually the width on Dow's Lane that's more than the width on Mazaro's upper field. Right, but we're talking about widening. No, currently, in its current state right now. Right. right. Dow's field upper is wider than Mazaro's is right. currently. And that's because of the runways. Correct. Well, we will uh, wait, Mr. Let me Wood. ask up. Sure. Well, um, on East 
field, um, what's the, um, is, is the irrigation uh, part of that package, is that required from a, a, a DEC or whatever point of view, or is it something where it's just a good thing for having a nice uh, good, good field in good condition? Irrigation is not necessarily a requirement per DEC. Uh, however, it would be, uh, if we're going to invest in having a natural gr grass field, uh, we believe it would be responsible to be able to install an irrigation system to make sure that we're able to water the field during dry seasons. Yeah, and now we, we're just reliant on whatever rain happens Correct. or whatever water flows across the field. And, um, what's the cost of irrigation in that field? Do we have that number just to refresh? Approximately one hundred forty thousand dollars, John. And that's to install the pipes and the sprinklers and whatever else. That would be yeah. all, all aspects from controls, installation, sprinkler heads, so and, on. And how do we pay for our water? Do we um, do we just pay just we just pay a, a village water bill like everybody else? Or? That's correct. And it's based on volume of water used. Correct. For the Penn State fans, uh, Michigan's up 42-30 at the half. <laughs> Is that, that happened as well? I must have missed that. <laughs> Which sport was that? <laughs> uh, while we're waiting for Mr. Whitney, <laughs> anyone know a song? Now, um, I was wondering, uh, Rich Wasbrock um, from Land, if you wouldn't mind just maybe taking a second to explain exactly what we're looking to do with Eastfield. So aside from the brief description that I gave before, if you could just talk about what the scope of the project would look like and what we've asked the board to consider tonight. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in uh, Reader's Digest version. Reader's Digest version. Uh, for Eastfield, uh, what the Fields Committee has uh, recommended uh, after hearing different options that uh, DEC has uh, looked at and found acceptable um, in, in context of the conceptual analysis is to reestablish a uh, soil cap over the field. Uh, the existing field has approximately one foot of suitable material in terms of DEC requirements for a cap. So what is recommended is to add one foot of suitable material and to um, reestablish a natural turf field at that location. Um, the the add-ons to that to make it functional and to make it maintainable from a DEC perspective is to improve the drainage, to improve <coughs> irrigation. Um, that's, as, as Dr. Harris said, is not a requirement from DEC, but when you have a natural grass field and you intend to use it, irrigation makes sense. It's, it's a logical add-on. Um, there's also a recommendation to install a a softball backstop, not with a, a skin clay area, but more as a practice area because it overlaps with the regulation soccer field. So to avoid the conflict, um, it was just install a backstop, not the full field. Thank you. I, I have one more uh, question. Sure. Um, with respect to the list of questions that Bob uh, read off at the beginning, um, I don't know if you asked this, I think you got very close to asking this, but my question is, can the administration also gather whatever information exists on the health risks that may still be present with the hybrid infill solution? Because obviously the organic infill solution may have 
health risks, but they're not related to crumb rubber since there's no crumb rubber in that. Um, but the hybrid solution will have more health risks than the organic because there is a crumb rubber base that is part of, that's why it's hybrid, I suppose. Yeah. So if you could just, and I guess it's also a question for land because I think when we're trying to do an apples to apples to apples comparison between hybrid, organic, and grass, that, which grass obviously has no health risk, um, that uh, we um, should have that information on the hybrid because I don't think we had that. Because a lot of the studies that are out there mm -hmm. pertain to from I, I don't so. mean to interrupt, but I, I, I think we, that was our intent from okay, when we were, right. we were setting yeah. out. Uh, and as we said, the, the challenge is going to be to identify what, the depth of that <laughs> body of research at this point in time. And the hybrid product is just being introduced to the market. Um, so yeah, I, I can tell you from, from my standpoint, I'd, I'd love to be corrected by Lan or anybody with more of a technical, but through the research I've done and seen, I've not seen a report other than a report from the producer of the hybrid infill that, you know, where a government, no, I've not seen it. And I'd love, if somebody knows, I'd love to see it. Um, the Penn State website, um, which is very comprehensive, has nothing on it. Um, we may be stuck looking at, you know, basing, you know, our decision on with the, you know, with the understanding that there's still rubber involved and we have the, all of the reports on rubber is extrapolating from that. But um, I, I'm just not aware of any and uh, not that I'm an expert, but I just don't know of any. And, and Rich, maybe you can confirm this. Now, the, the organic infill solution, the GeoTurf product, that does not have rubber infill at all. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, it's uh, it's a you know you could tell I've been researching this stuff too much to get on top of the questions. It's really a corn husk, uh, cork, and uh, and coconut uh, coconut bark uh, ground up infill. Sounds yummy. <laughs> Add some rum and it's a pretty good drink. <laughs> Um, okay, at this point, I'd like to uh, ask for a motion uh, to adopt um, item 3.2, which is the adoption of the East Field Remedial Option. And as I stated, even though she's not here to, to speak and, and cannot vote, um, Robin Kerner uh, fully supports uh, this option and wanted that to be known to the public this evening. Um, can I get a motion to approve uh, Article 3.2? Certainly. I have a second? All those in favor? Wait, can I just ask what sure. we're approving specifically? The resolution. Is, it's this. Yes. That's why I'm looking at it. I don't think I've actually read it. Sorry. You can go ahead and vote if you want. Yeah, the, 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 pur the purpose of, uh, of the resolution is to start moving forward with DEC with the plan that was uh, uh, suggested in, uh, to, the, uh, to the, the committee yeah, it, it really, uh, yeah. The, well, the, can I just, what, sure. we're not, we're not, what we're basically doing is we're approving the one foot cap right. of clean fill right. to, on, on top of East Fill, so that would bring it up to two feet of, of a protective cap total. Uh, drainage. Right. Um, and then all sorts of regulatory approvals. Exactly right. Such, right? right. And that's it. We're not actually in this specifically talking about irrigation that will tackle because that's not something that's correct you need to, and the point of this doing this now is because we want to get ask land to get and, and the, our attorney to get the process the regulatory process started because it's a long it, which we understand is a multi multi month process with right. the DEC that, that's correct is that a fair summary that's exactly the summary yes Okay, so why don't we start this over again? Can I get a motion to approve uh, the resolution that we just discussed in section 3.2? I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Four zero. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else in the community that has a comment before I uh, adjourn? Okay, seeing none, uh, our next, um, Dr. Harrison, anything else? Is there any, anybody on the uh, board uh, want to discuss the project side of the, well, Mazaros, I, 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 you know, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. You're talking about the, the, 
the, the non the facility non side of things, of right? Well, I guess we have gym lights, which is sort of our athletic, but right. Um, well, I, I, might, I, I just have one thing. Um, the the list that Dr. Harrison put up of the projects on his slide. I think we had talked. I had felt that the the first one, the rewiring of the campus was not something I didn't feel that was that, that project made sense and we would, wanted to delete that from mm -hmm. the list and I didn't hear I don't know what the rest of the board thought on that but but that's the one I would would uh, mention uh, why don't you I, I think where we left it everybody made comments I think that uh, Ms. Kashkin and yeah. Mr. Whitney Thanks. as being part of the uh, committee of the buildings and grounds committee was supportive of all of the tier one items nevertheless um, I, I've mentioned that I was supportive of the tier one items um, I don't know if there's been further thought uh, based upon Mr. Montgomery's uh, thoughts to, to relook at the rewiring of the campus um, lights and uh, uh, yeah. um, in the spirit of that actually I was reviewing the list and I actually mentioned um, to Phil as well, considering moving rewiring of the campus lights to a tier two and moving into tier one, the conversion of the gym lights at the high school. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're back. I'm sorry. Re uh, removing the rewiring of the campus lights to shut off from tier one to tier two. Right. And moving into tier one, the conversion of the high school lights to the LED lights. Actually, even before addressing that proposal, um, I, I thought it was really important for the administration, uh, Dr. Harrison, Ms. Miller, and really Gary Knowles as well, just to uh, consider are there any things that we are, would be missing if we were to do exactly what uh, Maria said in terms of moving the campus lights project to, to, to um, tier two? Because when we presented it, we presented it as an energy savings opportunity. Um, and I think the energy savings were really not significant, especially relative to some of the other projects. And I think, John, that was your initial reaction, well, was that yeah. the, the return on investment was not... The, the return on energy, the energy savings would have taken, I want to say, 25 or 30 years time. to realize, and you get pretty speculative at that point. But I just plus, to wait, plus the, I think the other issue was there was, not, there was no other benefit. Plus, there was right. the thought that Gary had mentioned that there were some safety function of having those lights on all the time. Right. And I just want to make sure that the administration concurs that moving that project to tier two and, and swapping in uh, the high school gyms project is advisable um, from an overall uh, buildings and grounds perspective. You know, can I ask here, because, you know, frankly, um, you know, I trust the work of the buildings and grounds committee, and, and based upon that work, uh, I was supportive. Um, but if you're willing to now amend your plan, um, which makes complete sense to me based upon John's, John's very sound comments. Could you go back and have that discussion with the administration with Mr. Knowles? Mr. Knowles is not here. He had a bit of a family uh, uh, tragedy happen um, and, and is with his family. So he, he's going to be out this entire week. But if you could speak with him and if the proposal is, um, you know, based upon John's comments and your own um, due diligence to move the 227 replace it by the 132 and you feel that that's sufficient and in the best interest of the district obviously it saves us a boatload of money and I, I think that you'd find a lot of support from the board and hopefully the community um, on that so if, if, if you could do that and then get back to us that'd be very helpful I just I don't I, I don't disagree with what you just said um, I don't see the logic of the of rewiring campus lights should be on either tier one or tier two. I think it just doesn't make sense to do. And I don't see why we need to keep it on tier two. Not that it matters because we're not going to do the tier right, two right. things, but you know, it's not something we would even do if we had more money, I think. It doesn't make, that's not a sensible way to spend money. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, um, I want to look at the, the gym. I want to go back to the material you had on all the gym lights 
uh, issues and just try to get more comfortable and feel like I get to know that and getting to know that those issues a little bit more because I, I feel like that's something I'm not entirely comfortable with just about the what we're doing there in terms of the timing of doing it relative to the lights of these different the, the life of these different things and, and what the I know that there's a benefit in terms of the quality of the lighting compared to what we have now and that's an issue so I want to I'll probably come back with questions and comments. if I could just ask you and I'm being a bit tongue-in-cheek but but seriously if you can go down to Main Street schools gym when the lights are on it, it, it's eye-opening as to how bad they really are. I mean, it's, right. it's literally hard to see with the lights on. You also can't replace right. them. Right. Right, I know. I know. I know. Um, yeah, I hear, I, yeah, that's, I, I, yeah. that's I fine. Your discussion. That's fine, and I think the one of those, yeah, there's Main Street and then there's Dows Lane. I think Dows Lane, you had brought up a point because it's more expensive in the, I think you had a, in the last meeting, you brought up a concern about that. Because yeah. the Dows Lane has the recessed lights that requires demolition to pull out the fixtures. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not remembering the detail. I know that there was one of these gyms that had that. But yeah, yeah and that was, I think, what uh, Gary and, and Lan talked about as well. OK. Um, all right, I, th I think that's all we have. Um, if uh, I can get a motion to adjourn. <laughs> so moved. Second. All those in favor? Hi, right, thanks everybody.